Good evening, church family. It's great to be here one more time and and come together with um, with Phil, with Stella, and Toby, and Andy, and we have Brent here and Terry today. And it's just encouraging to see their faces and to know that they're here to support um, these efforts that we're trying to put together the music. And I just want to thank you for uh, singing with us from home and being patient and. We are um, con we are continuing to pray for um, each one of you, and, and we can't wait to come back together and to be able to meet. But for now, we want to just sing to the Lord in this empty room, and knowing that He's here with us. And uh, um, I'm I'm really grateful for the the prayers that that we can um, bring before the Lord this this afternoon that we're here and knowing that the Lord hears and that, that he's pleased with, with a heart that is um, just humble before him and, and worship. And um, I just want to invite you to pray with me and, and start our worship and dedicate this time and the songs to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for um, how gracious you are, Lord. Uh, as we were talking earlier about your goodness and, and how you, you care for us and how you have provided everything that we need, Lord. Um, especially now, Lord, as we are going through these difficult times. Thank you for the provision of peace and joy and and every good thing, Lord, that you've given us to go through difficult times. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have given us because we we have you, Lord, in us. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace for inviting us, Lord, to come into your place, into your family, and to sit at your table, Lord, and to know that we are a reflection of Christ to you. Thank you, Lord. That is precious. That is the greatest thing because we don't deserve it, and we are uh, called your children because of your grace. And we just want to dedicate this time and this worship to you, and Lord, um, pray that you be exalted, even though we are here, just a few of us. But thank you that you are, you have promised to be with us every time we come together in your name. And, and I know that you are present and that you are here and that you are also in the homes of each one of our brothers and sisters. And we pray that as, as we sing to you at home, that you bless every heart, you encourage every heart, Lord, and that you uh, edify our spirits through your word, Lord, that, that you be um, showing us today. And we just pray that you bless this, this time and the, the Bible study and um, everything that we do. We want to put it before you and ask that you bless it and that, that you be glorified in everything, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh.
Because you're holy, holy, holy I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy Let's be encouraged with the words of a mighty fortress is our God. It's old, old song, but it's so powerful, inspired in Psalm 46. And I hope as you sing with, with us that your spirit would lift it up because our God is all powerful, almighty, and he's on the throne. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing Our helper, he amid the flood A mortal else prevailed Did we in our own strength confide Our striving
Thank you for the joy that you give us when we think of your words, of your promises, when we think of who you are and if we focus our minds and our hearts and the truth of your word. I pray, Lord, that you help us to diligently seek, seek you, Lord, every day and, and fill our hearts and minds with this truth that will be our, our foundation and, and, and this support that we have that nothing, nothing can move us, Lord. We thank you, precious God. You are good to us. Let's sing to the Lord. You are enough for me, Lord. You are more than enough, Jesus. Before me, the world behind me, no 
you are with me I will not fear because you're with me because you're with me be 
Welcome to Calvary Chapel to Hatchby. Blessed to have you guys here with us this Thursday afternoon and hope you are enjoying uh, the weather outside. Uh, the wind's a little cool, but that sun is uh, uh, shining bright and it feels good. And uh, hopefully you guys are able to get outside a little bit and enjoy some of that uh, sunlight. Uh, I think next week we're in for some more good weather, so look forward to that. And uh, glad you guys could uh, join us here this afternoon as we're going to continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of 2 Samuel. And tonight we're going to look at uh, the remainder of chapter 21, and then we'll start a little bit of chapter 22. Uh, I've entitled the message here tonight, David's Farewell. And really what we're going to see here in chapter 22 more than chapter 21 is David's kind of farewell song. And as I was reading through this last night and just kind of refreshing my memory, you know, I couldn't help but think about this circle of life, you know, a very cliche phrase, but it's very true, especially it's my daughter, Caitlin's birthday today, and it was my wife's birthday yesterday, and so you, you find yourself flooded with all these pictures from uh, when our kids were tiny and, and we were young and, and, and healthy, and uh, um, you just start thinking about life, and, and you know, David's farewell here, God is with us through every season in life. Uh, from the time we are little children, uh, God is there with us and he's using parents to care for those kids and to raise those kids and to instill uh, truth into those kids and to love those kids then it seems like we get a little older and we get a little more what we think independent and and then we begin having kids ourselves and it's a whole different season of life and then we get into the later seasons in our life which is where we're going to find david here and uh, David now looking back on his whole life and, you know, this circle of life, we come into the world as dependents and really when we are going out, uh, getting ready to enter into eternal glory, uh, we become dependents yet again. Uh, our bodies begin to break down. Our bodies begin to fail. 
uh, our minds begin to slow down. And what we find is like you find uh, with your parents or maybe your grandparents, that eventually the kids uh, are taking care of the parents. And it's just that the body, as David here, the, the Bible says that he became weary. Uh, he still in his mind was thinking he was able to do things that his body was telling him he wasn't going to be able to do anymore. And, you know, sadly, I think uh, non-Christians, you see this more than with Christians. Uh, but for some people, that's a very hard hurdle for them to come to. They don't want to uh, come to the reality that their bodies are slowing down. And so we're going to see David here, though, with this beautiful uh, farewell. And, and God is going to remain with David, even during this difficult time of him kind of having to uh, step aside and, and no longer go to battle uh, because he's more of a, a danger out there, as we're going to see. And so how David, um, you know, a lot of times will look at what a legacy, you know, I think all of us to some degree uh, care about a legacy that we leave uh, because truly a legacy isn't just a list of all of your accomplishments through life. Uh, some may have a long list and some may have a short list, but um, that isn't really what your legacy is. Your legacy is more of what you leave behind. Uh, and this is what we're going to see with David, uh, that he left the nation Israel in a better state than he found it. And so for as Christians, as, as individuals, I think this should be our desire uh, that whatever situation we're in, uh, that we leave it in a better state than when we found it. And uh, truly, this was David's heart and his desire, and he succeeded uh, in doing this. And so just an incredible testimony of David here as he is a man after uh, God's own heart. And so 2 Samuel 21 as last week we began the chapter um, hearing that there was this uh, great famine. There was a drought which then caused uh, this famine in the land. The famine lasted three years until finally David um, made the connection that maybe there was some spiritual disconnect or there was some sin in the camp or something uh, was displeasing to God. Something had separated them from God, so David began to ask of God, uh, and God told him that it was the sin that Saul had committed. And so we looked at this last week that it was some four hundred years earlier. We read about this in Joshua chapter nine that the nation Israel had made a covenant with the Gibeonites. And the covenant basically was is that we weren't going to put our hands on you. That we it was kind of like a peace treaty, uh, that they weren't going to kill the Gibeonites who were in the promised land. But then we read that was 400 years before the time we're talking about here. And then before this, Saul, when he was the king of Israel, apparently he went on some rampage and he struck down a bunch of the Gibeonites. And so a lot of time has lapsed from the time when Saul broke this covenant and went out and killed these Gibeonites to the time where David is here now and the drought came. Several years have went by, and now God all of a sudden, it would appear to us all of a sudden, uh, God is making them deal with this sin. And here's something we need to remember when it comes to sin, guys, is that uh, we may think we get away with something before God, but truly we never do. God may just be patiently letting us go, hoping and, and using some circumstances to get our attention to bring us to the place of repentance. Because really when we're uh, sinned against God and it's an unconfessed sin, really what the Bible says is that our fellowship with God has been separated. Uh, we are still a child of God. We are still saved. Uh, but that fellowship has been Broken, And so in order to restore that fellowship, uh, we need to come before him. And 1 John 1, 9 says that we need to confess our sins to him. And then, then that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so this is what David is, is seeing here, that there's this drought, there's this disconnect, there's this separation. So he begins to pray and God uh, pinpoints uh, the issue of sin in the nation's um, land. 
But look at what Psalm says, Psalm 51, verse 3, speaking about our sins before God. David, of course, this is Psalm 51, right after David committed that sin with Bathsheba. And Nathan, the prophet, came to him and and called him out on this sin or pinpointed his sin to him. Verse 3 says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. We never get away with anything. Verse 4 says, Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. So God sees and God is aware uh, our sin is always going to be first against Him. Um, and then when God begins to bring that sin to light, uh, and the, you sense that separation at times because our sin will separate us from God, that's the time we need to begin asking God, okay, God, uh, what is it that you're trying to pinpoint in my life? What is it that I need to confess? What is it that I need to change? Uh, and God will bring these things to light, and God will begin to reveal these things to us. This is exactly what he did here with the nation Israel. So the sin was is that Saul uh, broke a covenant, and covenants are important in God's eyes. And I remember Jesus even said it's better not to make a covenant or not to swear upon anything, to give your word. It's, it's better to just let your yes be yes and your no be no because if you make a covenant or you make an oath or a swearing, then God would expect you to fulfill that. So Jesus says it's better uh, to just be a, a man of integrity or a woman of integrity and you don't have to swear. And honestly, at times, it's... Very difficult when somebody has to swear by something else. It almost makes you suspicious of why they have to keep telling you that they're telling you the truth. Uh, Because that's usually the case. They're trying to cover uh, their real intent. Uh, But David here, and what God is doing, is that Saul had broken this covenant. He killed the Gibeonites. And so then David goes to the Gibeonites in verse 3. He asks them, He says, what shall I uh, do for you? So God reveals that it was the sin that Saul had committed of why there was the drought. So then David did what was right. And same thing that you and I need to do. We need when God begins to pinpoint the sin, then we need to address that sin. Then we need to to fall before him. We need to repent. We need to confess the sin. And then maybe we even need to make amends or recompense for that sin or atonement. And so this is what David is doing. He went before the king, and the king says, Well, you know, thank you. We don't want your gold. We don't want your silver. We don't want innocent lives. Uh, But what would be a good atonement for the sins of Saul, your old king, would be if seven of his sons or seven of his household uh, would be hung on our behalf. It's blood for blood, eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth, sort of a justice And so what did David do? At the end of verse 6 is where we left off. David says, okay, you know, I'll get you these seven men so that uh, they can then make atonement for this sin that Saul had committed. And so we're going to pick up here at verse 7. It says, But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath that the Lord because of the oath of the Lord, which was between them, between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. So the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, Armoni, and Mephibosheth, whom she had borne to Saul, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom he had borne to Adriel, the son of Barizeli, the Mephithalonite, Verse 9 says, Then he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the mountains before the Lord, so that the seven of them fell together, and they were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. So David goes before this king, tells him, I'll do whatever you want. The king says, I want seven men from Saul's house. So what does David do? He acts upon that. But notice here that David spares Mephibosheth. Truly, Mephibosheth would have been probably the best known son of Saul. Remember, he was the son 
of Jonathan, David's good friend. But David chooses to spare him. And no doubt, it says here, it was because of the covenant that he had made with Jonathan. That's found in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 15 to 17. This was basically when Saul was pursuing David and wanted to kill David. David was on the run, and Jonathan was kind of torn. He was the son of Saul and the best friend of David, and he loved David, and David loved him, and he loved his father. But his dad was in error. His dad was full of pride and anger and jealousy, and he's seeking to kill David. So Jonathan was in the middle of these two. Uh, he was still wanting to be obedient to his father, but you know he knew that Saul was doing wrong. And so Jonathan asked David, because Jonathan knew that God was raising David up and that he was going to take his dad down because of the sin. And so Jonathan asked David to make him a covenant, a promise, that when David came into power and became the king, that David would not hold Saul's sin against the family of Saul and that David wouldn't wipe out all of Saul's family. And so David here is in a, in a tight spot as this king is demanding seven uh, men from Saul's house. So he has no choice. It's because of Saul's sin that the drought came. But he does spare Mephibosheth in keeping with uh, that covenant that he made with Jonathan. Notice that it says they took these seven men out and they hung them. Uh, very interesting. They would have hung them, of course, on a tree, and so this was the atonement for Saul's sin. Very interesting that they would hang them. It was Israel who hung them. Why would they hang them? Well, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23 in the law speaks about a man hanging on a tree, uh, that cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. And so these men were the curse of Saul's sin, and so they were hung there on a tree. Does that story sound familiar to you? Because it was Jesus Christ also who was hung on a tree, who was the atonement for our sins that was hung on a tree. Remember what Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, that Christ Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. So we see this example here of uh, these seven men uh, being the atoning sacrifice to appease God uh, and this, to do justice before uh, the Gibeonites. Well, it was laid upon these seven men, whereas Jesus Christ is that same atoning sacrifice, uh, that He is the one who bore the sins of the world, the curse of the law. Remember that about the law. The law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. And thank God that Jesus took the curse of the law. He took the curse of death upon himself so that we can have life. Very similar to these seven men. They gave their life so that everyone else uh, then would be uh, free to live. And so these men hung before uh, the people and the nation. Uh, we're going to read about Rispa, one of the moms who was there and, and not letting the birds eat these men alive as they hung there on the trees and any wild animals come along in sackcloth waiting for God to accept this sacrifice and bring the rain uh, once again. But the men hung, hung and bore the curse for the soul's sin, or for Saul's sin, and so they delivered Israel from the guilt of their own sin. Verse 10 says, And Rispa, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until it rained on them from the sky, and she allowed neither the birds of the sky to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. And so, again, this is one of the mothers of two of the sons that were sacrificed there, that were hung on the tree, she comes as they're hanging there and sets her blanket there on a rock as she's keeping the birds away. A pretty graphic, brutal scene. I mean, you can imagine the mother's heart is just uh, breaking. Uh, but remember, guys, the wages of sin is death. There's nothing pretty about sin. This is what I see in this picture. Uh, so we shouldn't wink at sin. We should remember what our sin costs. Our sin costs Jesus uh, to bear our sins and our punishment there 
on the cross. And so this poor mother having to uh, see the wages of this sin right here and being taken out on her sons. And uh, so she's there and she's uh, not going to move until God relents and brings the rain once again. And of course, God, you know, guys, when we uh, fall on our faces and we ask him to forgive us and cleanse us from our sins and we turn from our sins, God brings that latter rain once again. And God brings refreshment and, and a restoring. And so this is what the rain is going to be a picture of. Three years of drought. You know what? They did the right thing now. Uh, they off, offered the atoning sacrifice. And so now God is going to relent and bring the rain once again. Verse 11 says, When it was told... David, what Rizpha, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the open square of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them on the day the Philistines struck down Saul in Gilboa. He brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin and Zelah, in the grave of Kish, his father. Thus they did all the king commanded. And after that, God was moved by prayer for the land. And so what a sight here. Uh, David gets word of what this uh, poor woman was doing there. And David... You know, something amazing about David, just a man after God's own heart. You know, David was a man of compassion. You know, one of the great characteristics is, is, is of, of us as Christians. And a very good gift, I would call it a gift, of being able to relate with people. Is being able to understand somebody else's story. Being able to understand the other side of the story. Uh, David was this kind of man. You know, he still, he never held resentment against Saul. Saul hated him. Saul did everything he could to try to kill him. And yet David still loved Saul. Amazing. Here, he gets word of what this poor woman is doing. And I have to believe he's moved by compassion. Plus, he still loved Jonathan. He still loved Saul even. And so what does he do? He goes and gets their bones. Remember, after Saul was killed and Jonathan, the Philistines took them and made a mockery of them. And thank God the men of Jabesh Gilead went and took the bodies down, but then just buried them there in Jabesh Gilead. And so David makes the trip up to Jabesh Gilead, gathers the bones together, comes back, grabs the bones of these seven men that were offered as an atoning sacrifice, and then goes to the region here of Zela and buries them with Kish, who would have been Saul's father. And so he buries all of the sons together there. And what a memorial. You know, David didn't have to do that, but David still wanted to honor Saul. And, you know, Saul, uh, we believe that Saul turned away from God. You know, where Saul's at today, I couldn't tell you. Uh, But I can tell you that as he was leaving this earth, he wasn't in a very good place with God. I'll tell you that. Uh, Saul, who knows what his fate is. But David remembered that Saul had done some good things for Israel. Again, being able to see somebody else's story. You know, David fought many battles and won many victories for uh, the nation of Israel. And so uh, David here honoring Saul still and Jonathan. And and that's a testimony. And and God is pleased with things like this, guys. That's what it just said right there. After all these things. And think about it. These people had to listen to what David said. Right? Because David prayed to God and God said, okay, okay. It's because of Saul's sin. So here's what you need to do. You need to go to the king of the Gibeonites and you need to surrender yourself to him. And so then when he did and the king said, okay, well, we'll call it good as long as you give us seven of Saul's sons. David had to go back to his people and tell them that this is what they needed to do so that God would relent. The people had to believe the king. They had to trust the king. So they did what the king said. Then David did this valiant thing of going and getting the bones of Saul. Remember, God still loves Saul. 
right? Saul is still a, a son of God's, but, you know, God isn't going to force himself upon people. Uh, God has given us a will and, and a choice, and what we do with that, we will be responsible with. But it's because of what the people did and believing David and David believing God and then David doing this a great deed for Saul that it was then that God said he was moved by the prayers of the land. And here's something that's interesting too that I think we forget sometimes. That from the period of time when Saul committed this sin to where we're reading right now with the three-year drought, this many years, the nation of Israel was in sin according to God because of what Saul did to the Gibeonites. But God was still answering prayers of his people during this time. But here's when God's ears became dull. Because remember, our sin will separate us from God. Is that when God begins to point out the sin. You see, God didn't uh, bring that sin to light. And so then God was still answering their prayers. But the minute that God pointed out this sin, it was like God shut his ears up. And God will do the same thing sometimes in our lives, guys. Uh, when we have some sin or we're harboring some wrong motive or something like this, uh, we will feel distant from God. And sometimes that's a reason. Because God is trying to uh, get us to the point of understanding and dealing with the sin that He's trying to deal with in our lives. So He won't answer uh, the prayers until this sin is addressed. And this is why I believe when David then finally begin to cry out and ask specifics. You know, okay, God, what did we do? And then God points it out. And so what an amazing thing that God here, you know, guys, with His patience and His long-suffering, uh, how many times has God had the right to strike us dead? And yet He has not. Right? It is by His grace. Uh, but I'll tell you uh, that when God begins to uh, bring something to light, we need to deal with it. Uh, and we need to deal with it quickly uh, and then God again will bring refreshment once we are uh, reunited with him and became a one with him again verse 15 says now when the Philistines were at war again with Israel David went down and his servants with him and as they fought against the Philistines David became weary verse 16 says then Ishbi Benabob who was among the descendants of the giant, that's Goliath, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight, was girded with a new sword, and he intended to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. The men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go out again with us to battle, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. And so David here in his 60s or maybe, you know, late 50s, early 60s here, uh, well beyond the battle days. But yet here is his heart. He's out there because he's a warrior. He's the king. And so he's out with his men. He's doing battle with the Philistines. But as I prayed, guys, you know, uh, I see it, you know, and I'm not that old yet, but I'm old enough uh, to see that I'm not capable of doing things I was able to do when I was 14 or 15 years old. My mind still thinks I'm capable uh, until I begin to try to do it, and I find my balance isn't quite the same, and probably I, I put on a few pounds, and so the equilibrium's off. And so this is what we see with David. He's still out there because, remember, David was uh, the great mighty king. Uh, he was the one out there who had the sling, and he's the one who stood before Goliath and took that sling and knocked down Goliath. Uh, you know, David is still out there thinking he's this fierce warrior. And so what did we just read? It says that he had become weary, guys. The idea is, is that he's slowed down, uh, that he's not the same warrior. And so this giant comes upon him. It would appear that David was in trouble here. As this giant was getting ready to maybe take him out. But thank God Abishai was there who saw what was going on. He came, he protected David, he helped him, and he killed the Philistine. But then I like what the men said to David, right? This is what a true friend, a good friend will tell you. Uh, Look, David, we respect you. You're this great mighty man. Uh, but you know what? You need to, you need to stop coming to battle. 
uh, your war days are over, David. Why? Look at how they end uh, the conversation. They tell him, we don't want uh, the lamp of Israel to be extinguished. You see, it's not that they were throwing David away. It was that David needed to stop going to battle because he was going to get hurt or get killed in battle. And look at the respect and reverence they had for him. Uh, We don't want the lamp of Israel to be extinguished. And just a beautiful uh, thing here. But we need to remember that we all are at some point going to begin to grow faint. And that we're not able to do the things that we once used to do. This can be a hard thing for some uh, to digest. uh, But it's a reality. It's Again, it's that circle of life. And uh, David was having to now depend on... On other people. This once valiant warrior who could handle business, he couldn't handle business with this giant. Now another one of his soldiers had to come and save him. And you know, that's that's humbling. Uh, But really, you know, we're going to see here with David that uh, we become dependent almost again in our older years. And so it's twofold to me here. What I see, guys, is that David, I've seen it too many times with men. A lot of the times it's men who don't know when to stop going to war. I've seen some of these great boxers throughout the years who were these legends, who were these animals in the ring, who were uh, undefeated and these great warriors, but they can never seem to give it up. They can never seem to accept uh, the reality that we begin to get weary. And so what do they do? They're 50 years old. And they're still thinking they got it. And they go in there and they're just getting brutally pummeled, you know, and and they just can't. And then there's people around them who sadly aren't saying, stop, you know, what are they doing? They're saying, oh, come on, you still got it, champ. You still got it. And, you know, you guys, we have to be careful here. Uh, But thank God for these guys that were able to come and protect uh, David here. And uh, here's what I'll say. It's, It's hard for David to see this day coming. Uh, But it's also hard for those around David. Remember, David was a hero. And so now these people who depended on David, who looked to David, who felt secure because of David. Now, all of a sudden, uh, David is needing help. And, you know, there's always going to be a time that comes, guys, uh, when your person that you're looking to, uh, that is uh, your strength, that at some point, maybe that person may be taken out of the way, and all of a sudden, you're going to be called up. All of a sudden, now you are going to have to go into battle, and you are going to have to be the one uh, to to support the king or to protect uh, the king. And so Israel is now seeing this great giant, you know, David, um, for us, a man, this great man of faith. Uh, we They're beginning to see him slow down. Um, but yet here they're going to rally around him and supply what David is lacking. Look at verse 18. It says, Now it came about after this that there was war again with the Philistines of Gob. Then Sebekai the Hushite struck down Saph, who was among the descendants of the giant. There was war with the Philistines again at Gob, and Elihan, the son of Jerry or Egim, uh, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was a war at Gath again, where there was a man of great statue who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also had been born to the giant. When he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of uh, the servants. And so what do we see here? You know, David uh, is kind of having to pass the torch now. Um, David, who was once this giant killer uh, who killed Goliath, he couldn't kill the giants anymore. And here's what I love. What we just saw in verses 18 to the end here of the chapter is that David had been preparing. You see, this is what a good leader does. You're talking about legacies and things like that. How sad is it to see somebody accomplish so many things, but then they get to the end of their road and it's like that great work stops. Why? 
Well, because that person hasn't been preparing and laying a foundation, right? And, and building those up around him because here's the reality uh, that when one is getting ready to step down and one is, is going off into the golden years or the retirement years, that God is always going to prepare and raise somebody else up. But what I love about David here is that David had prepared these men. So these men had seen David fight the giants. David was a great commander, very strategic. So these men were learning from David. So now when David is slowing down, they're protecting him. And now what are they doing? Well, they're being shown that they now can be the giant killers. Uh, that God was now uh, raising them up to take uh, the place of David. And so really just a beautiful thing, guys, is David now is going to, uh, he's going to have to rely on the people now to uh, care for him. Remember what the Bible says, too, that two are always better than one, right? Two are always better than one. You need to have people around you because if one person is out walking, I think the Ecclesiastes says, and he falls into a hole. Where is his help going to come from, right? But if there's two and one falls into a hole, then the other one can pull him out. Or if there's two and a robber comes upon them, they'll have better chances of trying to beat the robber. Uh, but if it's just one person, guys, uh, then, you know, it's it, two are always going to be better than one. And so, This is the picture here of what we see in David being the lamp of Israel. There is no greater king in Israel. There never was a greater king. And there still is not a greater king than David. David was the lamp of Israel. What does this mean? Well, David was the one who led Israel. Uh, David was the one who many people were looking to. And so uh, these men, uh, David was still going to be an intricate part of Israel. Uh, Because David couldn't go out to battle, David could still pray uh, for the ones who were. And and David was upholding this legacy. How important it is to see uh, for you and I, for those who are in the faith, who have ran a a race and they're towards the end of their race. And you just, you look back at this years, 20, 30 years of serving the Lord, of, of being with the Lord. And what does that do to the younger generations? Well, it encourages the younger generation, right? And it strengthens us. It's the same picture here with David. They believe they can do it because David did it. And so what a testimony, what an encouragement of David being the lamp and the light of Israel. And so they had victory over the giants, Uh, These men that David had trained, and what did they say at the end? Uh, They gave David some of the credit for them slaying uh, these giants. Why? Well, because David had instilled things in them. And so there was no um, fighting over, I'm better than David, or David's better than me, right? They understood that David was a man that God used mightily, and it was because of the things that David had done that had given them victory over these giants. And I just love how God cares for David here. You know, uh, God cares for us, as I said, through every stage of life. And every stage is different, and it's it's sweeter than the other stage, I think. Uh, And it's all leading to us one day entering into the ultimate rest, entering into His presence, where hopefully we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant, Enter in to your rest. But God cares for David here in his old age. And now he's going to raise up some other leaders uh, to carry on the torch. But remember this about legacy, guys. That it's not just the things that we accomplish that is our legacy. But more than that, I think it's the things that we leave behind. It's the work to endure Uh, that we want to see. We want to see our kids. Those are my wife and my prayers, especially with my little baby with her birthday today. But I want my kids to do better than I did. I want my kids to uh, achieve or accomplish greater things than I did. And for my kids, I set the bar pretty low. (laughs) I did that intentionally. But no, you want your kids to do better than you. You want Uh, better things you know there's nothing worse than somebody uh, taking their inheritance and squandering it on themselves 
right? It's taking that inheritance and using it for the next generation so that the next generation will be better off than you. And this is what we see with David's heart and with David's legacy. And of course, you know, it's, it's up to your kids what they do with the things that you've prepared for them. But your heart, my heart is, you know what? That's not, I'm out of, that's out of my control. Uh, but I want to at least leave them uh, the tools. I want to at least leave them uh, these, hopefully these things that they've seen me do and learn, good, bad, or indifferent, so that they would be in a better position than I was. And so after David's long service to the country as the king and his service to God, now David is going to reside in the contentment of the people. And this is the way that it should be. After those faithful servants have ran their race, uh, that then they can just settle into the contentment of the people or into the fellowship of the church. And uh, the younger ones can then take care of the older ones. So David was the lamp of Israel. It could be said that David fought, David taught, and David sought. And I pray that that would be part of what I leave behind for my kids, uh, that I fought the good fight of faith. Uh, I've ran the good race to the best that I could, uh, that I taught. Hopefully there's some things in there that I have taught my kids to do. And above all, that my kids would know that I sought, uh, that in every situation I sought uh, the Lord. And so three things there, hopefully earmarks of what we're leaving uh, behind for our kids. And so chapter 22, let's try to get into a couple of these verses here and then we'll close. Psalm 22, of course, is what I would say David's farewell song. Psalm or song. And so verse 1 says, David spoke the words of this song to the Lord in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. So the first four four verses here in David's farewell song, what is he speaking of? He's praising God for God's deliverance. How was David delivered? (laughs) David was delivered many times in his life. David was delivered from Goliath, the giant, when he fought with Goliath. David was also delivered from Saul, who sought after his life. And yet God delivered him from the hand of Saul again and again and again. David was delivered from all of the surrounding enemies, the Philistines and all the different neighboring communities. God continually delivered David from his enemies. David later in his life uh, was delivered from his own son, Absalom, who was a rebellious son who tried to uh, take over the kingdom. Yet God delivered David from Absalom. And the greatest of deliverances in David's life and probably your and my life as well was God delivering him from his sins. Uh, David committed many sins, a couple big ones that we know of. Uh, Bathsheba, the sin with Bathsheba, the sin with Uriah. Remember, David also uh, turned his back on God for a period of time. Remember when he fled and he ran to Gath and he uh, lived with the Philistines where he became a bandit and a robber for a period of time? Really a picture of David's backsliding, but yet God delivered David from his sins. And so how did God deliver him? Well, David said in verse 4, I called upon the Lord and he saved me from my enemies we have to call upon the lord guys uh, to be saved from our enemies verse 5 says for the waves of death encompassed me the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me the cords of sheol surrounded me the snares of death confronted me in my distress i called upon the lord yes i cried to my god And from his temple he heard my voice, and my cry for help came into his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of heaven were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. 
smoke went up on smoke went up out of his nostrils fire from his mouth devoured coals were kindled by it he bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet he rode on a cherub and flew and he appeared on the wings of the wind and he made darkness canopies around him a mass of waters thick clouds on the sky see what a amazing thing david is is picturing here and maybe you can relate to this that as david was surrounded in all these different situations and uh, his enemies were encamped around him and he was afraid and he would cry to the lord what he's saying here is that god moved mountains to come to david's need that's how david felt david was in trouble he cried out and he said i've experienced god coming down like a cherub flying out of the sky on wings of the wind uh, that when i cried to god god responded and and at times guys there's things that you try to share with somebody else when you're down and out and you have nothing and no one and you cry out to the Lord and God moves mountains uh, to care for you. Uh, you try to explain that to somebody and they'll tell you, oh, that was just a coincidence or oh, that just happens. And, uh, but yet you know when you cry out to God, God responds. And that's what David is saying here. Uh, you uh, shook the earth to come to my need. You uh, did these great things. Verse 13 says, From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice and sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were laid bare. By the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from on high. He took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They comforted me in the day. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me forth into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me me and so what a beautiful thing here guys uh, again david was very familiar with danger uh, being in places where uh, there's no way he could have freed himself there's no way he could have saved himself and he cried upon the lord and god did mighty things on behalf of david he shook the earth uh, the feeling that god uh, will be willing to do extraordinary things to come uh, to our help because why because that last verse says that God delighted in David. And so David saw God coming to him in all this glory and with great speed. And this is how God will respond when we cry out to him and we call out to him. He will come in all his glory into our situation. And with great speed, he will begin working uh, these things that he can do. And so David had a sense here, guys, is where we'll close. David had a sense of God's delight in him. This deliverance was based on a relationship. Why did God save him from these things? Because David felt that it was because this relationship he had with God. That God delighted in what David was doing. And let me tell you guys, God delights in you here today as well. That you are a child of God. And there's great delight. What greater purpose uh, does God have uh, but to have fellowship with his children, uh, to know them and to be intimate with them in their affairs, their daily affairs, uh, that God delights in these things and he's there. Like I've said so many times before, uh, we get a good night's sleep, you know, and, and we wake up in the morning and the picture of God who never sleeps is almost anxiously just waiting for your eyes to open and for your brain to turn on uh, to welcome you into this new day. And God is delighted uh, with you and he wants to have fellowship uh, with you and spend the day with you. This is how David had his relationship with God. A man after God's own, own heart, well, he would have to be a friend of God's. Uh, he would have to be a child of God's. He would have to have some sort of relationship with God for God to delight in 
him. And so we'll look at the next, the last bit of the chapter uh, next week as we'll just see uh, why God delivered David. Very powerful. The next couple verses here and how God uh, keeps us, guys. This is the most important thing uh, to remember that we can't keep ourselves. Uh, it's God who keeps us. In fact, this is what Jesus said in the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. We need God to keep us uh, because we can't keep ourselves. We can't do it on our own strength. We can't make atonement for our own sin. You see, we need Jesus. We need God to keep us. John 17 verse 12, Jesus says this as he's praying to his father. He says, while I was with them, his disciples, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that's Judas. So the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus says, I have kept them in your name, father. And God is going to do the same thing for you and I. Jesus will. He will keep us in his name. He will guard us uh, and we will not perish. And so what a beautiful thing here. Uh, Jude chapter 1, speaking along these same lines. Jude chapter 1 says, oh, where did I have it here? Does Andy have it there? Jude chapter 1. Oh, there it is. Jude chapter 1 verse 1 says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, listen to this, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. So those who are called, are you called by God here today? Well, that's a pretty simple answer. If you have heard the voice of the Lord and God has spoken to you and you've responded to Him, and you've asked for the forgiveness of your sins, and you've called upon His name, you believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth that He is your Lord, then the Bible says you're saved. Therefore, then you are called by God. You just listened and received the call. And so that verse says, to those who are called by God, a beloved in the God the Father, and kept for Jesus. Remember, uh, we are the bride of Christ. We are being kept for Jesus. So one day when Jesus returns, uh, we will be spotless. We will be white. We will be uh, that bride that has been prepared for him. And that beautiful relationship, right? That relationship, guys, it's all about a relationship with God. It's not trying to keep yourself right or keep yourself holy or keep yourself keeping the commandments. We can't keep ourselves. Remember, it's the law that brings death and the Spirit that brings life. We need Jesus. In fact, I think it's safe to say uh, it's God who keeps us. His grace is sufficient, and it's His grace that keeps us. And so keep turning your eyes towards Jesus, the author, the finisher, and the perfecter of our faith until we see Him again in glory. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your word here tonight, Lord. Thank you for your grace, Lord, that is sufficient. Thank you, Jesus, that we're being kept, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to do our part, as we'll look at next week, uh, the remaining and the abiding in you, Jesus, to keep a short list, Father, with you, of sins, that we confess our shortcomings, our tra trespasses and our sins. And we thank you that you're faithful, to restore that fellowship, Lord, when we cry out to you. Lord, that you come like an angel with wings, Father, flying down out of all glory to come into our little situation here. Little Gerald's trouble or little Gerald's confusion. Yet when I call upon you, it's like um, the old Batman movie with the red phone that rings. Uh, God comes and he comes quickly. And so, Lord, thank you. Uh, for this relationship. Thank you that for some reason you delight yourself in us, Lord. Uh, thank you, Father, for giving us life. Thank you for qualifying us, Lord. Thank you for calling us sons and daughters of the Most High. And thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die in our place so that we can now have a relationship with you. And so, Father, bless your people. Go with us now. Uh, give us a blessed week, Father. 
And may you always go before us. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy birthday, a very special happy birthday to Melissa who had a birthday yesterday and Kaylin who's celebrating a birthday today. So if everybody wants to sing with us, let's do it. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Melissa and Kaylin, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday and God bless everybody. 